thank you very much for the introduction and thanks for the SBIA organizers. As mentioned, I am the first presenter for the session and I'm going to talk about physicochemical characteristics of complex ophthalmic drug products to support in vitro bioequivalence studies. So as we know that agency has been publishing product specific guidances, uh, which also includes uh, PSGs for ophthalmic emulsions that provides for in vitro option to support uh, bioequivalence. In, and that typically includes that test and reference products to be Q1, Q2, that is qualitative and quantitative similar to each other. Uh, it also includes a battery of tests for comparative physical chemical characteristics or Q3 similarity, including drug distribution in different phases and an acceptable comparative in vitro drug release. So this bullet two, the comparative physical chemical characteristics, uh, Q3 similarity and drug distribution in different phases uh, is the topic of my talk. So for those of you in the audience who are attending for CME credits, the learning objectives include first to highlight the role of comparative physical chemical characteristics and second to provide expectation on validation requirements for drug distribution study. So here in this slide, I have copied the definition of comp complex products uh, just to remind us on the definitions and bullet three of the slide provides the definition of complex ophthalmic product that includes uh, formulations such as suspensions, emulsions, or gels. Uh, this slide shows the snapshot of contents from product specific guidance for difluoridinate ophthalmic emulsion. And this is just used as an example. And uh, the text shows the recommendation for in vitro option. And as uh, mentioned earlier also, uh, the first requirement is that the reference and test product uh, should be Q1, Q2 to each other. And then there are number of tests provided in the second part of the recommendation uh, for Q3 similarity, including drug distribution. And the third part is acceptable comparative in vitro release test. And as uh, uh, mentioned before, so the item number two on the PSG, which is physical chemical characteristics, including drug distribution, is what I am going to discuss further in this presentation. The physical chemical characteristics needed for Q3 similarity are listed here. And these include globule size distribution, viscosity at different shear rates, pH, zeta potential, osmolality, and surface tension. And you may appreciate that these physical chemical characteristics needed for in vitro BE, they're also relevant clinical and quality attributes for the drug product. So for instance, Drug retention in ocular region is most affected by viscosity. Viscosity and globule size distribution determine the release characteristics of drug from the formulation to the ocular region. And variation in pH could impart irritation in the ocular surface. Zeta potential and surface tension provide information on the stability of the immersion. So now one can see that the comparative physical chemical characteristics used for in vitro BE studies also help establish clinically relevant quality attributes for drug product specification to ensure batch to batch consistency for post approval throughout product life cycle. And the right pointing arrow symbolizes the product life cycle throughout. Uh, but what about the drug distribution in different phases? So now we can switch the gears and talk about drug distribution. Uh, drug distribution in different phases and its comparison with RLD is a one time requirement. Commonly reported methods include ultra centrifugation, where the emulsion is subjected to centrifugation at higher speeds to draw separation of phases, or phase separation by chemical means uh, by, by the use of uh, acid, base, or salt plus heat uh, to accomplish the separation, or ultrafiltration, where a semi permeable membrane filter with a certain molecular weight cutoff is used to lead separation uh, based on concentration or pressure gradient, and dialysis. And each of these methods have their own limitations and strengths, and we're not going to go into those details. And however, I would like to point out that uh, the agency does not have any uh, recommended method yet. So before we go on further in our discussion, let's take a look at the phases of an ophthalmic emulsion. Uh, this picture is adapted from the reference provided at the bottom of the slide and it depicts uh, the phase composition and drug diffusion 
in the micro environment of an emulsion formulation. And then there's a possibility of three distinct phases, as you can see. Uh, and these are the oil globules, the micelles, and the aqueous phase. So in this system, the hydrophobic drug is predominantly solubilized in the oil globules. However, due to the potential for excess amount for surfactant in the formulation, which also contributes to the solubilization by formation of micelles. And depending on the, the solubility of drug in aqueous phase, a minute fraction of drug is also solubilized in the aqueous phase. So one can appreciate that the system is in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. Another point I would like to uh, make on this slide is the role of drug distribution within the formulation that it can play in the release characteristics of the emulsion. So for instance, to initiate an in vitro release process, emulsion formulation are diluted with the release media at an elevated temperature, and it is typically 34 Celsius for ophthalmic products. And as soon as the formulation comes in contact uh, with the release media, the surrounding microenvironment changes accordingly. So that is the drug which is originally distributed in the aqueous phase, including micelles, is diluted immediately. And that lowers the drug concentration outside of the oil globules, which in turn disrupts the original drug distribution equilibrium. And that triggers the diffusion from oil globules towards the aqueous phase, and then further towards the release media. So one can realize that the initial release associated with the drug distributed in the aqueous phase where no rate limiting diffusion process is involved as compared to the drug diffusion from oil to aqueous phase. So this underscores the importance of drug distribution in the context of performance of an ophthalmic system, of an ophthalmic emulsion system rather, as it may affect drug release from the different phases and hence affect the bioavailability. So now that we can realize the importance and relevance of drug distribution study, the question is how to conduct such a study. And one can immediately think of two challenges. Uh, the first is the choice of method for the determination of drug in different phases, which offers minimal disruption due to the employed method itself. And the second challenge is that how to adequately demonstrate validity of that method. So while the choice of method is up to the end applicant. I'm going to discuss uh, considerations of method validation in remaining of the slides. So to discuss the validation considerations, I am using ultra filtration method as an example. And I have to reiterate here that the agency does not have any recommendation or preference of any one method over the other. So ultra filtration is merely used in a, as an example to demonstrate the validation considerations. And I picked it because it is the most reported one. And the method is based on using a suitable molecular weight cutoff membrane to separate different phases uh, and followed by determination of drug in those separate phases. And uh, the separation can be made using gentler conditions compared to some other techniques. And the method needs to be validated for its specificity and accuracy and suitability for intended use. To demonstrate method specificity, the separation method and membrane should be specific to the phases in emulsion system. For instance, if the membrane filter is used to separate micelle and aqueous phase, the filter rate should be measured for micelle particle size distribution to demonstrate that the micelles present have particle size distribution that is typical of this product. The filter rate should also be measured for drug concentration. Let's consider a hypothetical example where the amount of drug in different phases is provided for both test and reference product. And uh, another piece of information is provided is that membrane filter of different molecular weight cutoff are used, and then there are no further details. So the assessor who is going to look at this data is definitely going to pose this question. Uh, for method specificity, the molecular weight cutoff of the membrane should be shown capable of separating the aqueous and the micelle phase from the oil phase. So what is needed to demonstrate the specificity of the method for the membrane filters? As discussed, there are three phases of the emulsion, and those three phases can be separated as 
aqueous or aqueous plus micelle phase using membrane filters of two different molecular weight cutoff. And for the sake of this example, considering that we have membrane filter one, which has a low enough molecular weight cutoff to only let the aqueous phase, phase pass through and while retaining the oil globules and micelles as a retentate. And then we have membrane filter two, which has high enough molecular weight cutoff, which allows the passage of micelles and aqueous phase and only retaining the oil globules. So in order to assess specificity for membrane filter one, uh, what is needed to be done is to check the filtrate for the absence or presence of micelles. And of course, the absence of micelles in the filtrate is, demonstrate, is, a, is a demonstration that the, that the membrane filter used is specific for aqueous phase only. Whereas for membrane filter two, uh, one can check the filtrate for the absence of oil in aqueous plus micelle phase only, and then the determination of micelles particle size distribution. And, and then the demonstration of complete aqueous plus micelle phase uh, passage through the membrane. And this can be accomplished by varying the centrifugation times. So these steps would help you assess if the molecular weight cutoff is specific for the aqueous and aqueous plus micelle phase. So the prime expectation from method accuracy is the demonstration that there is minimal drug adsorption on the ultrafiltration membrane. And the degrees of non-specific drug absorption to the membrane are known to vary depending on the properties of the drug and the chemistry of the membrane. And as we know that commercially available ultrafiltration devices include membranes uh, which are constructed from a variety of materials, uh, including polyethylene sulfo sulfones, cellulose acetate, and regenerated cellulose, and which can cause different degrees of drug loss to the filter uh, due to adsorption. And uh, so in cases, if the drug adsorption to a certain extent is unavoidable due to the choice of the membrane, then the membrane can be pre-saturated before use. Accuracy of the method uh, can be demonstrated uh, by recovery of drug from the aqueous drug solution with known drug concentration after passing the solution through the membrane. And for this case, uh, the membrane of uh, low molecular cutoff weight or membrane one uh, as we considered in the previous example. And in this case, we, we understand that there are practical challenges uh, if the drug concentration is too low, and specifically there is a significant amount of adsorption uh, due to the choice of membrane filter. Likewise, recovery can be demonstrated uh, for the drug from aqueous plus micelle phase with known drug concentration and after passing through the solutions through the membrane, in this case, membrane filter two or MD sub MWCO2. And for this uh, purpose, one can use a solution that contains surfactant or placebo formulation. Now let's consider method suitability. So method suitability can be demonstrated by measuring drug distribution on batches, which are manufactured intentionally of non-quantitative equivalent formulations. Uh, and that can be accomplished by either varying surfactant or the drug level. And the proposed method should be shown capable of differentiating drug distribution of target formulation from non-target uh, formulation, which are presumably non-bioequivalent. So let's say uh, you formulate intentionally a non-target product by adding or subtracting the target amount of API and you can also formulate non-target product by varying, adding, or subtracting the amount of surfactant uh, and keeping everything else constant. And then you analyze the non-target product for the distribution of drug in different phases. And there is one possible outcome uh, is that you observe the difference of drug distribution in the non-target formulations compared to your target product which demonstrate that the ability of your chosen methodology to differentiate between target and non-target formulations, and that's okay. And the second possibility is that, uh, that you observe distribution of drug in phases of the non-target product, and that are similar to or close to the target product. And now that's one the question, whether your approach needs a reassessment and or modification. Now, finally, some additional considerations for the drug distribution study. So after you concluded the study and you compiled the data 
and now you have the results for your test product and the reference product and you are going to provide these results in some some sort of uh, comparison so i would like to point out here is that uh, the product specific guidances for ophthalmic emulsions do not provide any quantitative acceptance criteria for comparability so this is where we expect that you provide some discussion or some analysis that how your results uh, the, your results for the test product are compared uh, with the results for reference product. And also if you are determining drug in different phases, in aqueous phase, in aqueous plus micelle phase, or the oil phase, uh, then we expect that you would sort of do some analysis of the mass balance. And while you are conducting the drug distribution study, we expect that uh, you will do it on uh, three batches each of test and reference product. And another important aspect is that uh, the analytical methods that are being used to determine drug content in different phases, uh, they also should be adequately validated. A few words on data interpretation. Uh, as it was discussed in the previous slide, uh, the product specific guidances for ophthalmic emulsions do not provide quantitative acceptance criteria for uh, comparability of drug content in different phases between the test and reference product. So that means a discussion uh, is very helpful and a discussion is actually critical. If you observe differences in the drug distribution between your test product and the reference product and how uh, it relates to any clinical performance. And you should also provide discussion in the context of totality of evidence. That is how the drug distribution can be interpreted in the light of in vitro release data and globule size distribution data. Uh, and finally, I would like to bring your attention to this publication. This paper was published last year by our colleagues in Office of Testing and Research. And the work was conducted to understand better of how the drug distributes in emulsions, specifically between oil and aqua space, and how do we understand the roles of excipients or drug release testing conditions and so on. So this paper does not describe how to measure drug distribution, but rather it provides understanding of how drug distributes. So I encourage you to check this paper out. Now the time for a challenge question. Drug distribution study in different phases of an ophthalmic emulsion for test and reference products is recommended to A. Establish quality attribute for drug product release and stability. B. Justify formulation changes post-approval. C. Demonstrate sameness of test and reference product in support of in vitro PE determination. And D, assess the acceptability of manufacturing site. I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about it. And if you think the correct answer is C, to demonstrate sameness of test and reference product in support of in vitro PE determination, you are absolutely right. So to summarize what we discussed, uh, the comparative physical chemical characteristics to support in vitro bioequivalence may also provide roadmap for product quality specification. And the choice of method to determine drug in different phases should have minimal effect on the equilibrium distribution. And the choice of method that you have should be adequately demonstrated. And we discussed the example of ultrafiltration method. And we do expect interpretation of the results and discussion uh, on the comparability uh, of your data. And finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, my office management, Patricia Onyamba, Ben Kai, Susan Rosenkrantz, and Andre Ra, and a colleague from Office of Testing and Research, Jean Ming Zhu. And again, thanks to the SBI organizers, and thank you all for listening. And I hope to interact with you again during the Q&A session. And I now uh, pass it along to Dr. Yan Wang for her presentation. Thank you very much.